Hey gang, I got the dog here. Rio the dog is here to help with some screenwriting tips for impact and clarity. Let's talk about some things about the screenplay. You know, it's kind of a complicated beast. Um, it's loaded with all sorts of rules that have um, been accumulated over its hundred or so years of being around. And um, there's plenty of approaches. If you've looked at several different kinds, you can sort of sense a flavor about maybe different writers' approach to handling the same sort of thing. Um, there's lots out there about writing screenplays and writing even for television shows specifically. But I want to just say a couple of things that uh, make it easy for the reader, the final reader, and requires a little bit of work on the part of the writer, but produces the minimum amount of stuff in the screenplay to do the maximum amount of uh, impact. So let's take a look at some of these. So the only reason you might be writing a screenplay is it's either somebody told you to do it or you're doing it on spec, speculatively, saying, I just want to write a screenplay and see if I can blank. Maybe I'm going to make it. Maybe I'm going to sell it. Uh, either that or someone is telling you, hey, we need you to bring this to script. Please make a screenplay formatted version of this. So for us, that could be, uh, hey, we're going to go shoot this, so this needs to be in a production-ready format, or it might be an academic exercise like we have in a class like this. In either case, whatever you're writing is going to be read by somebody else and needs to be understood. All of the intention that you have for the story needs to be understood. Who that recipient is will make a little bit of difference in what you decide to include or not include. So when it's something that I'm going to immediately shoot, like maybe we're going to do a TV TV sketch and people are all lined up and we don't we already know what the set looks like and who the characters are and it might just be who's there dialogue 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 but something like that I don't need to do any sort of description or things it's a document for myself to make the thing that's that's one kind of format um, but I prefer to write it if, um, if I'm writing something that I care about writing something that um, it doesn't matter who's reading it, they're going to get the same thing out of it. So I'm going to avoid jargon. I'm going to be super clear. I'm going to emphasize the things that are important to the storytelling and the characters and not let it feel screenplayish. I'm going to let it read naturally. For people who maybe don't know much about the industry, they should be able to pick up a screenplay and they might not know what int and ext means, but they're going to quickly figure that out. And they might not know why it's arranged, but they can see, well, there's that person's name and the paragraph that follows it. That must be what they say. Pretty easy to pick up. So I like it when the format is invisible and you're not calling out things like camera terminology that's going to throw off the average person. The Probably the most important thing about the screenplay is if you can't see it, if it's not a visible thing, you can't write it in the screenplay. So if you are describing a character who's arrived for the first time and you say he likes ice cream, well, unless he's sucking on a piece of ice cream right there and smiling, we don't know that. We can't see that. You can't look at a person and go, oh, that's that kind of person. Unless you provide those sort of screen clues. So if you want him to be a bicycle repairman, who likes ice cream and uh, listens to ACDC. All three of those things could be visible on screen should you choose to include it. Upon including it, the audience will recognize that that must be important, otherwise they wouldn't have put it in there. It could be important because it's a joke. A bicycle repairman who likes ice cream and ACDC is maybe that's mad. It's pretty funny to me. So I say let's leave out camera specifics unless it helps the audience see exactly what you see. We're writing for the screen, so we should be screen-like. We should be able to do something that only can happen in the films. Dissolving between scenes is something that doesn't technically happen in a um, novel as we read it, but we sort of get that experience as we change chapters, right? The camera cranes up over the building. That's something we can't experience in real life. And we don't really say something like that in a novel. But it's So it's strictly the tool of the cinema creator, right? So I'm of the mind, though, that you can make something cinematic sounding without ever mentioning a camera thing. Let's take, for an example, my, uh, this from my... Um, pilot for the Haunted Thunderbird, EXT, that's exterior, trading post, sunset. Mitch and Benny, our characters, pull up to a plaster and beam tourist trap that looks like it belongs in the Old West. 
tires crackling across the gravel top parking lot, they park directly in front of a stoic looking wooden cigar store Indian figure. Some benches, some barrels complete the decor on the front porch of the trading post. Hand lettered signs proclaim cheese and moccasins. Okay, so do you see any shots in there? Uh, Mitch and Benny pull up. We might have established them in the car previously, so that could be a shot of the car or it could be a shot of them in the car. The fact that it says plaster and beam tourist trap belongs in the old west. We're probably looking at the building. So we've said this is an establishing shot without using the words establishing shot. Tires crackling across the gravel top parking lot. Sounds like a close-up to me, right? They park in front of a stoic-looking wooden cigar store Indian. Um, probably that's a medium shot or a close-up of the thing so we can see what it is. And then we've got some more establishing things that might have been up in that first paragraph. Be just uh, just the same to go to go stick it up in there. Uh, it doesn't really change how the reader takes it in. Might be a case of prioritizing it. So we saw in that an example of the new scene. Every time the viewer is transported to a new place or time, we identify that. Now, if your character is um, in his bedroom, the fire alarm goes off downstairs. He gets out of bed enters the hallway, approaches the staircase, takes the staircase down, is now on the first floor, exits the front door, is out on his front lawn. That's multiple scenes. That's four or five scenes, potentially. There are some odd exceptions to that, such as um, I'm pulling up to the fast food drive through I'm an interior car. If we film the outside of the car, we're exterior drive through if we do a back and forth between the person who's inside the on the headset mic and outside in the car it's interior and exterior it's a mix of those things so one way you can get around that is not addressing it <laughs> which is fine if you're going to go shoot it maybe you're labeling things specifically because oh at this line we really need to see the fast food guy say this line so we can see him roll his eyes whatever the case may be but another way to get around that is to use the word continuous you establish interior slash exterior at the beginning of that scene, then say continuous, and uh, it's up to the editor later to make some cuts, some visual cuts that go from uh, inside to outside here. Um, here's an example of that uh, interior and exterior. Um, someone's pulling up to the gas station. We're inside the gas station. An old man sits inside. He sits up. His attention is pulled from his Milton Berle type TV show. Um, cut to presumably what he's hearing or seeing, which is the exterior of the Silver Moon gas station night. Everybody, it's Benny, Mitch, and their friend Varla, Native American medicine woman and cocktail waitress Varla, scans the horizon as Benny stares up at the service station sign, which looks like a big uh, backlit fiberglass moon that's spinning around. Benny says, wow, is that really what the back of the moon looks like? And he says, that's not even what the front of the moon looks like. So we've gone uh, interior and exterior there. It's a continuous um, period of time. The old man is reacting to the arrival of the car, but it's, uh, it's different in that uh, it's inside and outside. A pretty common example of that. The next part of this is screen direction. This is where the, um, all the action is going to be described. That can be new characters arriving. That can be locations being uh, exposed to us for the first time. The what happens of the show takes place in these uh, bigger paragraphs, upper and lower case. And it's really there to draw the picture that the writer sees in their head and sh wants to share with the rest of the world. And eventually the director goes out and makes those pictures. Um, when we see characters introduced for the first time, they're in all caps. Um, once we've done that, they go back to upper and lower case. And... Um, we don't need to describe them again unless they perhaps change their clothes or, or something. Again, stick to only those things that you can see on screen. Uh, here's an example. As we see these guys for the first time, this is the very first shot of the pilot script for Haunted Thunderbird. Interior Thunderbird Lounge. We're going to do this super quick. A late 1950s supper club atmosphere with an unflattering Native American motif. Boom, done. That's the place. The title song, which we just heard in the opening credits, resumes in a lounge format as capital Mitch Paisley. What is he? A low rent Dean Martin. Okay, might be all we need to describe him. Is at the microphone. He finishes singing Hunt to Thunderbird. Sporadic applause. Thank you. Thank you. Both, both of you. 
an enormous muscular Hawaiian man stands nearby, Benny Kahuna. His foot is tapping, pointing at his watch. Boom. Name of the character, what they look like. We need a visual. Uh, it might be in your head. Make sure that the audience is uh, on the same page as you. We don't want them to um, fall behind. When we come to dialogue, you saw that we have the char character name over the dialogue. That's um, It's in a specific place. Kind of, It's not centered. It's tabbed ahead. Um, this is why the screenwriting program is preferred to um, trying to just do it manually. You'll never get it. Centered looks wrong. You want it to be in the same exact place in a column so that an actor holding the script can read it. The dialogue that happens after that is also in a very narrow column, which makes it easy to read if you're carrying that script around doing blocking, for example. So that's where that source comes from. That's why those look the way they do. And then there's something that you see occasionally called the parenthetical. That is where we generally have a very, very short phrase in parentheses between the character's name and what they say that lets us know how that line is to be read. I would use that extremely sparingly. If you're using it for every single character's line, you're probably actually describing screen direction. Uh, itching his head. Well, then just say, Benny itches his head, and then go to the line if you want uh, it to be there. The nice thing about doing that is that you're breaking things out of the block of dialogue and moving it into screen direction. And if you do that for every line, that means you're sort of suggesting a new shot every time somebody else speaks. And it kind of picks up the pace. It makes it seem less like, oh God, this is a play that's dragging on and on and more like a, a film. So um, I would only use it when the subsequent line might be misinterpreted if it were not clarified with some kind of very brief note for the actor, because that's what this is about. So take the line, you brought me flowers, period, or question mark, or question mark followed by exclamation point. If we say angrily, you brought me flowers, there's only one way to say that. But if you look at that, even the question mark and exclamation point tell you really how to say that line, so you might not need it. There's a safety in, in using less. This is no guy. He's a powerful, kitschy manitou that you angered. Thanks, Benny. I can always count on you to remind me of my mistakes. Oh, that's okay. I just figure you need help keeping track of them all. So the fact that he says it cheerily there means that he genuinely wants to help. Oh, that's okay. I just thought I'd help. Um, boy, you see, I kind of a little bit like Barney Rubble there. If it's an action, you know, just break it out of that parenthetical. Get it into screen direction. Uh, again, that makes that dialogue scene less seem less like a play, uh, it's a line after line after line, endless endless talking, and moves it back into uh, action. So here, this uh, also uh, translates to, can you have somebody make a look instead of a line? Um, so here they are back at the uh, cigar store. Indian is actually the thing that gives them their missions where they go out and chase down these spirit manitous. Benny is uh, taking some notes on what the Indian had said. He says, the beast that changes there, the moon waxes full. What does that sound like to you? Mitch says, that sounds like a great time. You could probably put a parenthetical on that because you could say that a number of different ways. And then the crow, this uh, black bird that uh, follows them around and makes sure they do their jobs right. He says, hey, Paisley, it was your own foolhardiness that brought you to this sad condition, crashing into the sacred totem in your inebriated fugue. Uh, I, I, that's a really terrible line because it's giving us a whole lot of backstory uh, kind of mechanically there, but um, I, I try to save it here by turning it into a joke. Mitch says me, he doesn't say me, he just mouths the word me, which is difficult in animation and it's easier in live action, but he points at himself, me. And meanwhile, his other hand is coming up. Somehow he's been driving this car to the place. Somehow, somewhere from out of nowhere comes a cocktail and he swishes it a little bit before, before drinking it. So, you know, that's an opportunity to potentially take a character moment and move it out of a, a line. Me? You talking about me? and turn it into a bit of action. It's the only one I could find. It's not a very good one. The writer's job here for the screenplay, the teleplay, is to communicate to a number of different people. The director, the people making it, the visualists behind it, the actors who need to take the lines and make sense of them, make uh, 
as Harrison Ford says, create a character and behavior that helps tell the story. That's how he has defined his job as I just uh, create a character and behavior that helps tell the story. So the director is going to get the following things from the writer. The writer needs to communicate these things. What does the world look like? It's going to inform all of the visual departments of the, uh, of the production, background artists in animation, character designers, in uh, live action, costumers, hair people, set decorators, and so on. Tons of people need to get information. Some of this might just be as simple as a f ugly 50s supper club in an unfortunate Native American motif. That's enough for a team of smart people to go out and research what that means. So that could be enough. So what does the world look like? What's the tone of the show? The jokiness, the seriousness, the scariness. Can we get that stuff out on paper? I would um, ask yourself, what does my show feel like? Write that down on a post-it. Set it down beside your script. And now read through your script and see, does the post-it tell the truth at every page? Is there something on every page that makes you laugh if it's funny? Uh, and so on. What's the tone of the show? What happens? Obviously, that's the minimum to get across in a screenplay is the this and the that and the what happens, the ABC. And then hopefully we go a little bit deeper and we get to see how these characters relate to one another. And that's that's going to come out if um, Biff punches Marty. That's okay. That's a, We get that relationship that's patently obvious. Some will be less obvious, subtler. When it comes to what the actor needs to know, the writer of the screenplay can probably hold back. You know, we don't get to give them backstory. We don't get to tell them how to say a line. The intention is that the actor is going to go through that script, pour over, and this is the actor's method, is to pour over the whole script about what the character says and does and what other characters say about that character and what they do about that character to that character and so on you're giving the actor clues they get to play detective they have to that's that's in their domain but you should make it easy for them you're not going to hide the important stuff but you're also not going to lay it out for them on a big craft services table here's what i just said to somebody that I think is pretty good. We're going to give the actor the exact information they need to arrive at the same conclusion you did about the character or the action or the beat without ever having to tell them what to do. Not too many directors are going to read your script. Not too many actors are going to read your script. It's time to make sure that the general reader gets what they need to out of it. This includes academia, you know. Uh, this includes your peers uh, reviewing it for you. They need to know what happened. If there's any lack of clarity about what, what do you mean what happened here? I, the guy disappeared through the door. I don't understand. If there's any of that, then the script doesn't work because it's not a communication document. What am I supposed to feel? That'd be nice if we walked away feeling something. If it's not clear what we're supposed to feel, like somebody says something really serious and then there's an off-color joke and we go, I'm not really sure what the tone of this is. That's generally not good. Now, you can be all over the place, but you should, you know, make those transitions, uh, ease those transitions, a little bit like a roller coaster. There's at least a pause before the, the, car, the carts go over the hill. And lastly, maybe we're lucky... Possibly. What did I learn about life? What did I learn about myself? Organically by reading the material. So we might not know it that we've been lectured to. That's ideal. But we might have seen some insight into the human condition, even when it's vampires and waitresses or um, adventurers or whatever. Okay, so this is TV, right? It's not like a movie where you have to be one and done uh, potentially, you can take your time. Even in something like a little 12-minute episode, um, you generally establish the milieu really quickly. 12-minute um, episodes tend not to be serial, right? They tend to be uh, episodic. So you've already got a, a world. Uh, my go-to for this one is something like the Powerpuff Girls. In the title sequence, sugar, spice, and everything nice, we learn what the Powerpuff Girls do, um, and how they got their powers 
and what their names are. Uh, and uh, Professor Uton- Professor X and the Utonium and the yeah, nah, 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 right. So we know everything we know in, and that's pretty common with animation. We know it in the titles. So now we can kind of take our time and get on to hopefully what is a properly act structured little little um, self contained story. And even if it's not, remember, okay, so these are forty five minute stories, and they've got four to five acts. Um, I've got thirteen episodes. So I don't need to rush those people into a relationship. It may take seasons for a sexually tense couple to actually um, connect. So take your time. This is TV. That's what it's for. Um, milking those moments. There's also some philosophy that says you should start your story at the last possible moment and end it at the first possible moment. What that means is make sure that we're not starting too soon before um, the real content hits. We should know within the first four or five minutes what the big conflict of the show episode is. And then ending your story at the first possible moment, um, especially with serial stuff, that means we're going to hit it at a cliffhanger that does not solve the problem, but in fact ejects us into the second episode and uh, where we're going to solve all new problems there. Okay. So there's some things to think about on the screenwriting front.